welcome back to my Beyond Barriers series with me, Ella B. I really hope you're enjoying the interviews guys because I'm back with another one today and this one is our penultimate interview so it's our second to last one and it's a really really exciting guest. Once again we're visiting a new sport of swimming. So that's really exciting, we haven't had a swimmer on the show yet. So I would like to introduce you to Liz Johnson. Now Liz has a full set of medals, so she's got a gold, silver and a bronze from three different Paralympics. She is a phenomenal swimmer and has achieved so much within her sporting career. Now since retiring in 2016, she has decided to set up her own business venture and I'm so excited for you to hear even more about that. Not only is Liz an amazing sports athlete and a hard-working businesswoman, she is also just an infectious character and just such a lovely girl that I've always had such a laugh with. So I'm really sorry, this interview does have quite a lot of catching up within it, but I hope you enjoy it and I really hope you enjoy hearing Liz's story. So without further ado, I'd like you to hand over to Liz. Enjoy! Bye! Hiya! How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thank you. Yeah, there, was, there was a bit of surprise sunshine. So, well, yeah, because I'm still supposed to be getting married in like four weeks. And I'm like, hmm, okay. I better practice actually looking like a human being. This so is so exciting. Man, I can't <laughs> wait for you. <laughs> like, saw so your workouts as well. The workouts. Yeah, to be fair, it's kept me very busy, which has been good. So, yeah. I'm fit. Favor for me. The other thing has kept you fit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is true. I would have really slipped in lockdown otherwise, I think so. Yeah, me too. I'm actually, I'm in better shape now than I was pre-lockdown. I feel it's because I've got the time to actually do do some workouts. Like, normally I'm rushing home from work and I don't get home till like 8 o'clock at night and, you know, I can't mm, yeah. be bothered right now. So. And, the, and I think it couples with the eating as well. Like, you can mm. control what you're eating more when you're in your house all the time. And cook, like, proper meals. Yeah, 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 rather that than... That by the at the station that you're going to eat on the train that is like yeah I, meal deal <laughs> i mean i did i do think like i love my life and i wouldn't change it but i think and i wouldn't want it to be like that that mundane repetitive all the time but i do think people undervalue it sometimes <laughs> well yeah. i'll go for it and i'll hope it won't keep you too long i'll try not Don't to worry, it's fine. i know you're busy so all good how are you now it's good for me. It's good to be busy. Um, so I normally start off talking about people's like childhood and find out what they were like when they were little. Um, so you've grown up with cerebral palsy, have you? Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you when you got diagnosed with cerebral palsy? Uh, so I was I was only six months when I got diagnosed. Tiny. No, I was tiny, and actually, I think like that's quite rare to be diagnosed so young. But I think it was. It was a combination of a few things, really. Like, my mum was a teacher, so she was aware, I guess, of yeah. how young people develop. But also, I have a cousin who's exactly a month older than me. And okay. I think when he, like, he was starting to do things, and then I was maybe not doing them in the same way, or um, my mum was starting to notice things, then I think that was what brought it to attention. And I remember, actually, for London, we gave in all our medical notes. So we got a copy of our medical notes to give to, I can't remember whether it was to British women or to Paralympics GB, but so they had them. So if anything happened, uh, they were on file and they were easily accessible. And I remember getting them and reading through them. And it, was, it said stuff like, Mrs. Johnson has brought baby Elizabeth, and no one calls me Elizabeth ever, but like <laughs> right at the beginning, because she's noticed that, you know, she always goes to grab with her left hand and not her right arm, but, but her right hand and her right hand still always scrunched up. And like, I had all these different notes that were actually really, really interesting. And I think it, my mum, my guess, like I said, she must have just been quite insightful. Um, so yeah, six months was when I got diagnosed. Tiny. And do you have any brothers and sisters? Like, did, did that help you growing up? Did, did you have any role models to look up to and say, oh, I've got no sympathy here, I'm just going to get on with life? or? Uh, yeah. So I think it was the, actually the flip. So like I have a sister, but she's five and a half years younger than me. So I okay. didn't have anything to compare with. But I think that was almost better in some respects because I then just got treated as a child and do what everyone else is doing. And I was out with my friends and I had no, like I was going to do whatever they were going to do because my sister is, we're very, very different, but, but she is, even though she's younger, she's always been very protective and very supportive and um, even when she's not speaking to me 
if if I need assistance with something because of my impairment, like she'll come to the house, do it, and then leave again without speaking to me. But like she'd always <laughs> been, do you know what I mean? But she'd always been in my corner in that sense. But I think I actually I benefited from being an only child to a point because my my parents had the time to support to to support me and not that people don't when they've got other children but like literally if it took us five days to master me tying my shoelaces then it would take five days and that was okay because there was yeah. no one else really that that needed their attention in that manner so I think actually like it swings and roundabouts isn't it and you play you play the cards you're dealt but um I had re I've got really really good friends I've always had really really good friends and like I think everybody in my life like is very reliable so even though they're not necessarily blood related like I've got that that extended family around me that have enabled me to be who I am oh I totally agree I think good friends is definitely the way forward I know my friends give me no sympathy whatsoever and I, I just have to do everything yeah. <laughs> I get on with it so yeah for sure um, so were you sporty growing up? Like, did you always like sport? Did your parents encourage you to get into sport? Or? Yeah, so I was really, again, my, my parents were really open-minded, actually. And, like, they did what any parent does and take, take their children to lots of different opportunities. But I was really fortunate where I grew up that there was a lot of other children around. So we did. We played. Basically, we went, we went through the year with yeah. what was seasonal and topical at the time. So when Wimbledon was on, we were playing tennis in the street. And when, <laughs> like... In the winter, we'd be playing uh, football and then we'd go to, and then the Six Nations would be on and we'd be playing rugby and then we'd go <laughs> down the field to play cricket. So, so we, and we rode our bikes and I, I learned to ride my bike really early. I was three when I learned to ride my bike. And I think one of the reasons was because it gave me my mobility because I, I could, I could, I could walk, I can walk and I can run, but I spent my life on the floor. Like, and it didn't bother me. <laughs> Yeah. But like, I think what my bike did was it enabled me to, to go for longer and to get further and to be independent. And I, like, so, so yeah, we rode our bikes, we did everything. And I, well, I was super competitive. And actually, I think there was a, they were, we were in a group of kids who there was a lot of different ages. So we spanned quite a bit of, like, we were the youngest, actually, me and my friend. And then, they, like, they, they had older siblings. So we all played yeah. together. So... So yeah, we learned to compete and we learned skills, but in that really informal environment. So it, it felt fun all of the time. Um, and I know the world is always changing, isn't it? So like now everything now seems to be a bit more structured. Um, and you're like, you can't always play out in the street because it's not always safe or there's too many, there's way more cars on the road. And again, our house, we were number one, like my parents' house was number one in the road but it was 150 yards up the road after you turned in. So like, and it was a straight road. So cars, we could see cars, cars could see oh us. My. Yeah, they knew yeah. we were playing there. It was a really residential zone. So we're really, really fortunate in that sense that I was able to explore things and I was able to practice. And I think the difference was that because it was an informal environment, nobody was telling me how to do something. They were just telling me what needed to be done. So then I'm sure you're the same, like you just, so then you naturally just adapt because, and you're not even, you're not even adapting because you're just doing it your way. Whereas I think now, even as an adult, when you go and learn something new, things are a lot more structured now and they'll say, oh, this is how you do it. And so now you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna be able to do it like that. So how am I going to do it? And then you can still and figure you it out, but like, there's just a little more a pressure and a little more awareness yeah. about the fact that you're not doing it like everybody else. Whereas in like being older, yay. Uh, but like one of the <laughs> best things of being older is that, that that informal environment when nobody said, oh, hold a cricket bat like this and then swing bat like this and do this. Like they just gave you the cricket bat and you hit the ball. Do you know, and you just, found what works for you. <laughs> yeah. Or nobody taught you to catch. The ball went up in the air and you caught it. And that was oh, fine. No, <laughs> now you have, you go to, you're like, you're in a school environment or you're in an environment. They go, right, today we're going to learn to catch. So what you need to do is cup your hands. Do you know what I mean? So I think, again, I benefited from that, um, like that free spirited way of exploring the fun elements of it and just, and then being competitive definitely helped. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I loved playing out when I was younger though. We always used to play out in the road and till like really like when it was really dark and then every car that went past would be like car and everyone just moved out of the way. And I feel that, that now, so like, obviously now, especially 
like in lockdown, you couldn't go further than your street, right? So, and, and, in, and in one respect, lockdown has been really good for me in that sense, because I'm never home. We're like, neither of us, are, we're rarely home. So, yeah. like, our neighbours, like, or, or we get in really late, and then we're out really early. Like, and then, so you don't often see your neighbours. But because yeah. they, were, they were around, everyone's around, you met your neighbours and you got to really know them. And the, and the kids, they, they, they are, they're young, so they're out on the street. And I'm the one going, Car! Like, and I just feel like I've been transported back, like, 30 Your years. Youth. <laughs> Car! Yes, I've got Car! And it's like, but that's exactly what we did. And it's nice. Yeah, I love, I miss those days, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then you, dis- you tried out lots of sports, but you discovered, how did you discover swimming? Swimming discovered me. No, so like, <laughs> I, I learned to swim. I went to swimming lessons, like like you do. Um, well, I did one of those crash courses in half term. Okay. You know where you go every day at the same time for the week, and then hopefully yeah. at the end of the week you swim your ten meter badge. And luckily yeah. I did. And I was four when that when I did that. But like yeah. I played all sport, and like I, at, at school and in the street, like I said, and then. Swimming was always there because like, you work your way through your badges, don't you? And then um, I basically got to the point where in primary school, I was in year four and they were picking the netball team. And basically everybody played netball except me. And like I did, I played in PE. And yes. like, I was decent. Like I wasn't, I wasn't any worse than anybody else, yeah. but I used to footfall, right? So like I was never going to be able to play in a competitive environment where they couldn't make allowances or bend the rules okay yeah so the structure of it didn't allow for someone with cerebral palsy hemiplegia to play netball right so and my friends were all like yeah but why not because she's better than us and like and that i guess i mean like i had loyal i've got very loyal friends but very real friends too so if they were they wouldn't have like ever bigged me up if if i didn't deserve it or yeah charity or pity or anything like that but like they were like, no, genuinely, have you seen her play? She's better than us. And I'm like, oh, bless them. I know. And we were eight. Like we weren't even very old, right? Oh, and, cute. Um, I know. And but they were more frustrated than me. And so then I remember going home to my mum and saying, oh, and it, like, and it was, I was like, fine, I'll go to this swimming club because she'd been talking about this swimming club for people with disabilities because she like she was a teacher, like I said, and so she she but she was in a different county and she used to. Um, take her class to the swimming pool and the one of the lifeguards there ran a swimming club for people with disabilities and so I had always so that's where I did my swimming lessons so I I knew of the the people but I had never I'd never been to the swimming club for people with disabilities and I'd never really wanted to go because one I was like I don't know if I want to be in a swimming club but two I'm like I'm not disabled I can do everything everyone else can do like why would I need to go there yeah um and then I was like so after I couldn't play netball, I was like, fine, I'll go to your, your stupid swimming I'll place. give in, I'll yeah, go. <laughs> basically. And like, it was the most liberating thing I ever did. And I think it helped that like, the lifeguards that were, that were around at the, at the swimming club were the same ones that taught me, like I went to swimming lessons with. That yeah. definitely helped. But I think I got there and I just realised that actually for the first time in my life, I didn't have to try and fit in because the fact I was different was what made me fit in. And like, there was this, I just, it was like, it was almost like you just exhale this breath of air. Do you know what I mean? And, and it was really liberating. And then I guess it just went from there really. Um, So then how did you then get spotted for, um, to represent GB? I think again, the the great thing about swimming is it's, it's not subjective really no. it's based on time and, and there's a distance yeah. that doesn't change and actually it doesn't matter what pool you're in other than like a 50 meter one or a 25 meter one but like a pool's a pool and yeah. okay you might there might be a bit of wind if you're racing outside and, and you do get fast pools but um like generally you're in control and so i think like yeah just there were times and you'd hit them and then you'd get like a letter inviting you to maybe a squad or to go up to the next squad in your lo- in your own club, and you would move through the program that way. And so that for me, I think my first real experience of deciding, yes, this is this was going, and this is where I wanted to go was, I went to my first nationals when I was ten. They were they were in Darlington. I loved that. Wow. Then. <laughs> but like, it was a very long time ago. But um, and like I swam with 
I swam with older people. So like I swam with everyone was like five, six years older than me. I was the youngest yeah. by a long way. But it meant that I wanted to be like them. I wanted to go with them. I wanted to be as good as them so that I could start going on to the squads that they were going. And my first one of my first letters came from it was the CP sports squad. So it was England and Wales and they used to do uh, little training weekends. And at that yeah. point, like it was still parasport wasn't what it is now, you know, like there wasn't the like now you, you're educated right from the off as an athlete on the on everything it takes to be an athlete. But then you were like, yeah, you can swim and you're quite good. So, you know, come to this and we'll explore what else you can do. And like we would in our in our lunch break, we would be playing rounders outside. And like I remember the swim team, um, they challenged the CP football boys to a um, to a match and the swimmers won. So that tells Tell you, right, exactly right. So, I mean, it was 1997 and that happened. <laughs> but, like, but ultimately the point is that like, it was a very different world then, but actually I came into Paris sport at exactly the right time, I think. Like it was, it was growing and it had momentum and people were enthusiastic about making it what it is today. Yeah. And so I couldn't have had a better experience in that sense so yeah it all started with that cp sports squad and then it went from there really um so how old were you when you first made your first international debut so i was 13 so it's, you're very young still yeah yeah i was super young well you say that and then but like actually swimmers are young like they are was, uh, yeah. yeah do you know what i mean like so but I was at that time. I was one of the younger ones, and I'm, there were a few others of us around the same age. But like then, there was a big jump to the next next group, really. But what it meant was, like I said, you you wanted to be part of it, and you you actually learned so much from them. And I think that was what I realised was sport gave me more than just being a good swimmer and being a good athlete. Like it helped me. It gave me the independence. It gave me the the motivation and the drive to want to go away. But yeah, so, but things like people, you swap skills. So someone will go, how'd you tie hair with one hand? You're like, oh, I do it like this. And like, or, yeah. and I'm, oh, but I can put my socks on with one hand. I do it like this. And you, like, you would swap ideas or you'd, and I think, I think that's something that's never left us. Like we still do that to this day, mm. like problem solved together, which is good. And um, so then going on, you were selected for Beijing. Yeah. Um, Beijing was a tricky games. Yeah, it? so Beijing was, Beijing was the games that I'd always targeted to try and win. So like I went to Athens and I'd, I'd got a silver medal and I was like, well, this is amazing. And I, like, I've definitely made the right choices and yeah. I definitely want to be a swimmer and I don't want to retire now. And I want to go to the next ones and I still really want to win. And I, I went to university in between Athens and Beijing. Um, and I, that's a big, that's a big time to go in between a cycle like that. That's hard. Yeah. So, yeah, and originally I always wanted because I'd always wanted to travel, and like my uh, some of my best friends they went backpacking when we finished our A levels, but I went to Athens when we finished our A levels. So uh, a bit but different. Also, and, I, and I remember saying to my mum like, oh, like I wish I was going to Australia, and she's like, you're not really built for backpacking, are you? And like, <laughs> and, and, but she didn't mean my impairment. She just meant I'm not someone that like like I'm just not that way inclined. Like. Uh, I'd be like, I'm not sleeping on there, ah, there's a bug, or like whatever. And she said, you're going to be better off, like working hard, getting yourself to a point where you've got enough money to, to travel in style or to do good trips. So, I mean, if you could see my life now, she would have like totally nailed it, didn't she, with her particular yeah, from all absolutely. But, um, but yeah, so I, so I thought I wanted to go to uni and do one of those courses where you did a year abroad. But if I was going to do that, then it meant that it took it took the course to a four year course, and it meant that like I would have been doing my finals on the way to Beijing. Yeah. So I was like, no, nope, I'll do a three year course, and then I'll graduate, and I'll be able to be a full time athlete because I'd never been a full time athlete. I'd always been in education of some kind. Uh, so I did, and I got my and I went to Swansea University, and it was amazing. And I met some of my best, best friends and I had some really good experiences and I got the, I got the right blend of um, being an elite athlete, but enjoying university as well, because I think, and I think the reason for that was in Swansea, we had different squads that trained alongside each other. So the, so the um, able-bodied sprint performance squad, they were there and the swim club was there. And then there was another um, program there. And then there was our para swimming program. So it, like we were all in the same boat and we were pretty much all studying 
like in yeah. some shape or form. So we, we, we had a good like extended family of people that all understood each other. And then I lived with people that weren't athletes, but, um, and that's could, as well. So yeah. you get that break. I could be a student vicariously through them, you know? So like yeah. they would, so they would come back from a night out and I would get up like an hour earlier. So it wouldn't mean for you because it was like a 4 a.m. get up rather than a 5 a.m. Yeah. But then, and I would like catch up with them on their night out and I, and then I would go swimming and they would go to bed. And so like, I, and I think like you said, it's, it's really important. And like I did, I, I swam well, I studied well, I got my degree, I became the fastest person in the world. I like, I, I went on major, to major championships. I was, I was yeah, I, I broke the world record. Like it was exactly really where I wanted to be. And then going into Beijing, I think like, like I said, I dreamt of being a full-time athlete and it, it was amazing in terms of you could just recalibrate your life and be like, okay, yeah. it doesn't have to be so stressful and you don't have to go to bed at half past eight. But then like two major things happened really. Like my, my mum got sick um, and she got diagnosed with cancer. And then I injured my shoulder, like my good arm. Yeah. So from the day I qualified for trials, at trials rather, to the day we flew to Macau for our prep camp, I yeah. didn't swim a single stroke or brush stroke. Um, wow. Like, so for six months, pretty much, I didn't swim a single stroke of breaststroke and like everything I'd known basically just got ripped up oh no out plan. but again like you said like it was so important that I had people around me that were grounded and, and helped me be grounded and had them weren't athletes and weren't swimmers like I, I think that year taught me that life is about balance like whatever yeah. you're doing however much something matters to you and however much of your time it demands there's an element of balance required in everything because actually if I had swimming was my everything it was my main my main priority in life and everything I did was geared towards swimming but I couldn't swim and there was nothing we could do about it so I still yeah. trained but I had to completely do different training and I I couldn't I mean I haven't got as much to work with as everybody else to start with no like you're limited then and you don't want to then hurt other other limbs or other parts of your body because you've overtrained in that area so I think I learned to trust other people and that, like I really learned the power of like teamwork yeah because yeah. I think as a swimmer it's not that you you don't know it if you don't know it's that you're part of a team but ultimately there's an element of well, if I mess this up, it's not, it's, I'm the one that, that's my fault. And if, if I succeed, I'll share it with everybody. But if I mess it up, then I've only got myself to blame and it's fine. But actually, yeah. I realized that I had to trust others and their input in all different areas, whether it be nutrition, medical, like the science element of it, like my family, my friends, um, just to keep me on a level keel, really, and not let yeah. me overthink things and panic that everything I'd ever worked for was about to go up in smoke. And then, um, yeah, and my mum, like I said, she had cancer. So, um, and then we found out it was terminal as well. So, and like, I remember that being the worst. At the same time as you still being injured. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it was all going on at the same time. So, but I actually think, again, like, it was a bit of a blessing in disguise because I couldn't throw everything I, I, everything I had into training in the sense I could, but the training took on many different forms. Whereas had I been fully fit, I would have been like at that port, maybe eight hours a day. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, ha I spent time with my mum and actually she, we talked about lots and lots of things and like, and she was always really good at giving me perspective anyway throughout my entire life. But like the injury, like she was just like, well, stop moping about it because like what, which bits of it can you control and what can you do to make sure that you've, you've got the best chance. And I was like, so, and it, so we'll get so better. Yeah. Doing that. And like the conversations that we had, like I got to ask her things so that like, I didn't, um, I didn't have any what ifs or what would she have done or what, which is, which was important because she then she did she did end up passing away like the day that we landed in Beijing. And yeah, so I ne would have never got that opportunity again. And like, I mean, I'm not I'm not massively spiritual or anything, 
but I definitely have learned to believe that everything happens for a reason. Yeah, even, definitely. even if that reason isn't apparent when you want it to be, and when you're like, "Come on, now's the time." Yeah. I mean, why, 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 why this is happening? Absolutely. But, um, and everybody needs something to believe in. I think is is the key. Um, but for me, I I think that yeah, t- like timing is everything, and these things happen and you could change them but would th- then they would change you and like you evolve because of the things that happen to you and how you respond and the opportunities that open up so in hindsight as hard as that year was I wouldn't have changed it because I think if I if I hadn't been injured then I would have lost a lot of time with my mum that I would never have ever got the chance to have again really um, and then yeah so and like it's hard because some days like I miss her every single day but like I think because it was so momentous the way it all happened and like there was nowhere to hide and everybody knew about it and obviously then I did go on to win um and again yeah. I'm not sure I would have won like had she had she not been sick and not passed away because I think I probably would have I used to be a bit of a panicker and like a worrier and I did used to waste time worrying about things I couldn't control and like, but when I stood on the block in Beijing, none of that mattered. And I just swam, like, which is what you do, right? It's why you practice, whatever sport you do or whatever you do in life, like when you play a musical instrument or whatever it is, you, you practice so that when it's showtime, you're ready and you should be able to enjoy it. But I think- And that's the thing that's familiar to you. That's the thing you know what to do and you know everything inside out so you can do it. But I think I used to, when I was younger, I used to waste a lot of energy, even though that's what's supposed to happen. The night before the race, I'd be like practicing my turns on my bed. Like, that's going to help you. But like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it'd be over- you feel like you're doing something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whereas in Beijing, none of that happened. I was just like, you just got to get there and back before everybody else. So then how long, so you were in the village and you decided to stay. How long then did you have between... 10 days uh, get there and then you'll race 10 days yeah so, so 10 days later you won a gold medal i know yeah that's Crazy, insane isn't? how how on earth were you in the right headspace i don't know but i think like, you it's, like strong. It was, i think think again that's why i think you know when they when they use athletes to speak and they use athletes and in other in other capacities and like you all have it yourself like whenever you go you go a job like it was especially as a freelancer like they see the traits in you that make you a good like basketball player, a good athlete, or like good at anything, like whatever you decide to turn your hand to. And actually, I think it's that. It's that ability to be resilient is is, a, is an overused word, but it, it's necessary. But the resilience, you're not born with it. It comes from preparing yourself for whatever life throws at you or whatever your environment throws at you. And in a training environment, the reason you train and you practice is so that you can react, you're prepared to react. And I think for me in Beijing, that was the lesson I took away from Beijing was that like, what happens to you never, you can't control what happens a lot of the time and it it should never define you. But like people will always remember, and you will always remember and have to live with how you reacted. And in a situation like that, there's no right or wrong way, but you, I guess you've got to believe that in you somewhere, your, there's the strength to get through whatever you need to get through and that like I like and it gets all a bit cheesy and a bit cliche at that point but like yeah. I genuinely think that is true because if if I had had to just race with the preparation I had in 2008 I would not have won that gold medal like there's no yeah. hope anywhere there's no amount of money no, nothing would have made that happen right whereas it took that 12 years of preparation and and motivation and hard work was what meant that actually when like you were saying earlier when you get on the block or or you hear the whistle go whatever it is you you go into this autonomy and you just do it and it was a couple of minutes in your life you just you just did it yeah it was one minute and 41 seconds exactly it's not even two minutes so you you, yeah just yeah. get your head down and... yeah perfect yeah um so then you got to then you carried on to london yeah and london must have been an exciting game because it's home games for a start um but also they recognized your achievements and they allowed you to lay the last tile didn't no, they yeah, but in... london was london was amazing for so many reasons and i think 
I was able to enjoy it a little more because I yeah. didn't want, because I'd already won. And like yeah. something else. You'd already proved it. your point. <laughs> yeah, and that didn't mean that didn't mean for a second that I wanted to win any less in London. No. But I think it meant that I didn't have that what if I'd ever win? And like of course we all know not many people like we like in our world, like and I'm sure your audience like will be will be in a position where they know a lot of people that have won. Or at least I've got medals, you know, and actually, but what we forget is that's not the real world. The real world is only, yep. if only a very small amount of people have won or have got yeah. a medal or have even been to a game, right? So I think your, your viewpoint. And you were already like, one of them. Yeah, yeah. But your viewpoint is slightly distorted when you're putting all this pressure on yourself that you need to be one of them, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But like, but it did change the way London went for me. And it also made me realize that you, you should you train really hard and you feel really rubbish for the majority of the four years so you should really take in every moment and enjoy it and I think yeah the great thing about a home games was that you could be involved in so much of it so like like with the designing of the kit and with the designing of the venues and like you said with the laying the last tile and just having so many people that had supported you in your career whether they were the person who took your notes when you were at university or they yeah. you know they, they, you, they fed you and you or gave you their dinner as well when you were at school and you were starving all these things like all of these people all of a sudden could be part of it with you yeah um and yeah it was amazing and then i think like when we got to the opening ceremony and i was reading the oath that was like that was bigger than anything i'd ever done and you've been chosen out all these athletes. Yeah, 4,300 yeah. athletes. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's me. And like, That's in some so respect, cool. um, like, that was, that was bigger than winning a medal in some respects. Yeah. Let people do that. And then, yeah. And so then, um, how did your competition go in London? So London was all right. So I, like, you get bad years. And I remember at trials, I swam so badly. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and then at the second trial, I swam a lot better but um, my, I, my, I used to have this thing, I still get it, but like it's more problematic when you're swimming, um, that my shoulder would sublux and it would like half come out of the socket and then I couldn't get it back in. So I remember swimming like halfway down the second length in the, in the second trials and it'd come out and it, uh, but it, anyway, and I, so I missed the time both times, but even though mm -hmm. Charlotte and Charlotte Henshaw had as well, but even yeah. though we'd missed, we'd both missed the qualifying time, we'd both still swam the quickest two times in the world that year. So Thankfully, sense prevailed, and uh, we both got selected. And then um, we both got the, on the podium. So Charlotte got the silver, and then I got the gold. Yeah. And like, and like, I wasn't even like in that instant moment. I wasn't even disappointed. Like as time went on, I was like, oh, bronze. But I went, no, I'm happy. I've got a full set, and I swam as best I could on the day, and I swam four seconds quicker than I did at trial. So. Like, it just wasn't my day. And, like, you hear athletes say that all the time. I'm going to do everything I can. And if, if someone beats me, then it wasn't meant to be. But it is genuinely true. There's only so much you can do, um, yeah. especially in a sport like swimming. Like, you can't dive into the other lane and pull someone's leg or, like, hit them with a hockey stick or any of those. Like, I'm not suggesting that you should. But, like, you know, you could. <laughs> swimming, there's not a lot, really, that you can do. And so, no. like, yeah, I was just, I was just really grateful and relieved to make the podium in front of a home crowd and at home games and yeah, add, add to the medal tally. My OCG and me would have been like very satisfied that I'd had all three then. Yeah, that was but, me. I, was, yeah. I did say that. I was like, well, if I couldn't win, I might as well get a full Might set. as well get I think, is, yeah, <laughs> I think that is genuinely what I said in the mix zone. <laughs> so, so it's silver in Athens, gold in Beijing uh, and London. Uh, and, London. London. and I wouldn't oh, change the way I won them either. Like, because the silver made me like realize how much I wanted the gold, but I was really happy with the silver at that time because it was my first medal. And, it, and you wanted to do that as a career, yeah. that was a setting stone. The gold in Beijing like cemented everything for me and like, and it signified such a change in, like, in my life and an opportunity and it like opened up so many opportunities and gave me a platform. And then a bronze, like honestly, nobody really, kid what you won in London and if you got a medal the noise was the same whether you, like you or even if you didn't get a medal like the noise was insane if you were a British yeah. so uh yeah no it was amazing what a good support and um, so your aim was then to carry on to Rio but it just wasn't meant to be was it yeah no I think like I was in that phase where like 
I still loved it and I was still good at it and I still enjoyed it and I was still swimming well. Like yeah, like yeah, the year after London, I swam four tenths of a second slower than I did in London. And like, there's not many people like six months yeah, later. Yeah, there's not many people around the world that did that. I was happy and I was still. Yeah. And so like I did, I started to take up other opportunities. So when I did get offered the opportunity to commentate or present, and I, I took it or where I or to start doing athlete mentoring, I did it because I was like, you can't swim forever. And it just got to the point where I was like, I'm out of time. Like, and then I got an offer like from Channel 4 to join the broadcasting team. And I'm like, it's time. Like, that's the sign. It's like that it's not an either or. Like, the decision has kind of naturally evolved for me. And then when I was in Rio and I was commentating on the race in the morning, after the heat, I, I put my headphones down and I turned to Paul Noble and I went, I'm so glad I'm not in that race. Yeah. <laughs> I just knew it was going to be really fast in the evening. And it was, it was really fast. And like Charlotte's ran really well to get a bronze medal, but like it was rapid. And I was like, I wouldn't have gone that time. Mm-hmm. And like, that's not a reason not to be there, but like the, I felt like the next chapter of my life had already begun. You've gone out on a high as well. You yeah, know. yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, no, so I'm very, very like grateful, but also fortunate that that's, that's the path that it led me down then. Yeah, really exciting. And I met you, which is lovely. <laughs> um, but then also after your retirement, you also decided to set up your own business as well, which is a really exciting venture. Um, what, tell us about your business. So I think again, like it all goes back to the idea that like people, the Paralympic movement wasn't always the, the amazing um, spectacle that it was now, or the res- only didn't get the respect that it deserved and it wasn't the opportunity. But sport is just one sector of, of life. Yeah. And actually, like the conversation we had about not many people making a team or, or getting a medal or getting a gold medal, like people forget that sometimes. And they meet a person with a disability and they're like, so do you do sport? Are you a Paralympian? Do you want yeah. to like, no, don't like sport. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I don't like, no. And like, so I think I, and like my, I did my, my degree was business management and so like and I've always been passionate about equity and like fairness and opportunity and empowering choice and I've never liked prejudice and I've never been okay with bullies and I I just don't like injustice basically at any level and I was like well actually like I've got this platform and I need to do something about it because I think the thing that really sparked it for me was that the employment gap for people with disabilities, I heard a stat that it hadn't um, reduced in like 10 years. It, for over a decade, it had sat at over 30%. So a, a person with a disability was two thirds more likely to be unemployed than an able-bodied person. And I'm like, okay. how is this okay? Like, And how has it been allowed to be okay? That, that yeah, that. So, and I, so then I set about originally looking into why that might be. Um, and it's a combination of reasons. But one thing that, that, that stood out that, um, as something that we could potentially do something about was people's understanding about difference and the exposure and education they have around it. And actually the empathy that goes with that. Because, and like we were saying right at the top of this, like the difference between how people view you when you've got a disability or a difference of any kind. It's almost as though you, that society has this idea of how we should all be. And then you you lose percentage points based on, I don't know, whether you're female or or what your age is or what your culture is or what the color of your skin is or, and then disability always seems to sit even lower in the, uh, Uh, when we're talking about equality, because, because people don't have the same expectations of people with disabilities. And like, for us, it's really frustrating. But actually, the real reason is that it's because they don't understand and they don't know. Because if you speak to people who like older people, well, they didn't go to school with people with disabilities, because people with disabilities weren't allowed to go to mainstream school. It just didn't happen. So they're basing their their judgment and their perceptions on of what they know what this, they know and their experience yeah. so i tried to set about like basically personifying why it wasn't that way and why we should just normalize difference so yeah the ability people are staffed entirely by people 
with um, impairments or disabilities who can work remotely whatever hours they want and we work as one big team with the main goal of educating around normalizing difference and then sometimes that leads to helping organizations recruit but what, what it really does is helping organizations ensure that their current environment is authentically inclusive so that the employees they already have within their organization feel yeah. free to be who they are and maximize their productivity, optimize their performance, and just be who they want to be without it preventing them doing the job that they're capable and wanting to do. And then during lockdown, we were able to finally launch our Podium platform, which is essentially a platform for freelancers with disabilities. So if they sign up and list themselves with their skills and their, like, and their capabilities, then organizations who've got jobs that maybe, maybe aren't looking for a full-time person or even a, a, like a long-term contractor can like it's almost like they can connect via the platform yeah. um, and we wanted to make sure that like it was giving something back so when the freelancer signs up they nominate a charity of their choice and then a percentage of the fee 50 percent of the fee actually goes to that charity so so hopefully what it That's does huge. is give people the opportunity because some people don't want to work full time. That's okay. okay. But I think the thing that it, the podium platform does is removes the first stage of the awkwardness in the sense that the freelancers by being on there have, have indicated they have an impairment of some kind. And the, the organizations who are provided providing the opportunities, they, by engaging with podium and that individual have already said, well, it's okay. We don't, it, it doesn't like, it, it, it's not an issue for us. It should yeah. be an issue, but like it actually isn't. And then if you evolve to a point where you want to discuss it, you can, but you don't have to. Um, because I think so many people, what I realized when, when setting up the ability people was so many people had so many negative experiences of looking for jobs or recruitment specific agencies or, or, do, or massive gaps on their CV that the older you get are harder to explain, but you can't just keep saying, well, people didn't give me a chance because, and that's the reality sometimes is they just haven't yeah. been given that chance that they deserve. So hopefully all of those things together will get us to a point where people with disabilities feel that the rest of society and the rest of the world and every other sector reflects sport but it took us 30 years to get there with sport, so, you know. Yeah, but if you aren't, do if you aren't doing this, then who, who, you've got to start somewhere, and you've definitely started something, which is so exciting. I can't wait to see where it goes. Like, yeah, yeah you've helped so many people already. Yeah, we're all in it together, I think, is the point. Yeah. Like, and that is one big difference, I think, with the disability demographic, is the majority of people realise that the mountain we are all trying to climb is so big that we will all support each other and we will all help each other and we will we'll also use each other. And I don't mean use each other. I mean, utilize people's skill sets, yeah. give them opportunities to help them to get places because we realize that actually, back to what you said, it's one of those things people just don't understand. They don't know it. So the, and the only way they're going to get that opportunity to, to, to gain that understanding is if we show them positive examples, which goes back to what we were talking about when we were kids about needing role models that are like you. Yeah. You, well done. You've done, you've come full circle without meaning to prompt you. Well done. Thanks. Thank you for tying that up nicely. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I love your work anyway. I love what you're doing. So it's amazing. So you definitely keep working hard. Well, um, and I've got one more question that I ask all my guests. Uh oh. Just because I think it lightens the mood also, but you find out a bit more about the character of the person. Um, but I feel like in every, when you're an athlete, but also when you're hard businesswoman like you now, um, you always need some downtime and need to switch off. So what is your guilty pleasure? And this can be like food or it can be Netflix or it can be anything really. So whatever you choose. I have so many. My problem is I've got quite, <laughs> an, I've got quite an addictive personality. So like, <laughs> It tends to be like if I start watching something on Netflix or Prime, then I literally binge watch the entire thing. Um, and and like, similarly with a good bar of Galaxy, like if I open it, then it's generally gone. But I, like I think my biggest escape is travel, but obviously we can't do that at the moment. So I'll stick, I'll stick chocolate and Netflix. <laughs> stick with Brazil, that's still a good opportunity to get out of the country. So 
I do think when I get there, I might not come back for a while. I mean, I don't blame you at all. Really don't. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I've kept you far too long and I know you're very busy. So Sorry, I think so I kept you. I was the one doing the talking. No, no, I loved it. I've learned so much about you, so it's great. <laughs> and um, have a fantastic wedding. It's so Thanks. exciting. Well, have a lovely time. I can't wait to hear all about it. Next time I see you, we'll have to catch up. Yes, well, yeah, hopefully that's not too long. Yeah, well, we'll see how we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, thank you. And it's lovely to see you. So thank thank you. you. I'll speak to you soon. Cool. Have a fun afternoon. The rest of it anyway. I know. I've got good at this Zoom wave now. You're like, bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.